Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Boca Podcast. I am your host, Nathan Holritz. I hope you're doing well today. Um, I know I've been like an old person talking about the weather this week, but it is so encouraging to actually get these podcasts started with the sun shining outside, blue sky. I had the, the chance yesterday to actually go riding uh, on my motorcycle, which I've not been able to do as much as of late. It's been a little bit on the cold side, at least for Chattanooga. But I had the opportunity to go out riding with uh, a good friend of mine, Josh Newton, a, a fellow photographer, actually, from the industry. And we took our Ducatis out and went for a nice little ride around sunset. It was beautiful out. And I'm looking forward to doing more of that, especially with this kind of weather. But it's good to see you all here today. To, I say see. I wish I could actually see everybody in person. But for those of you that are live streaming and for those of you that might be listening to audio after the fact, I'm glad to have you here. Counted a privilege to be able to to be able to have conversations with you and with our industry at large and ultimately hopefully add a little bit of value to what you're doing in business and life. And um, actually, I just want to add one quick note here as I do before every episode, before I introduce our brand new guest for today, Charity Water. I made my donation to Charity Water before the episode started today. I've got a a little screenshot of the receipt up there just for accountability, but I just want to take this opportunity to once again, encourage you all to look for those opportunities to give to your local community or to national or international organizations. Um, The fact that we even have computers or phones that allow us to get on these live streams puts us in a place that is quite advantageous in comparison to some. And um, something like Charity Water allows us to be able to give to those that have really significant needs. So just look for those opportunities. A little bit of money goes a long ways. And uh, I'll leave it at that. All right. I want to introduce a brand new guest for today. Jason Sebastian's here with me. Jason, thanks for hanging out with me, man. This is going to be fun. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nathan. Big fan. (laughs) Well, and you know what? I'm going to put this out there for all of our listeners, too. Just letting everybody know how you and I connected. You actually sent me a DM, I don't know, three weeks ago or so. And Mm -hmm. uh, you were like, hey, why don't you have these particular photographers on? Because I ask for recommendations sometimes. And I said, wait a minute. Why don't we have you on? Um, (laughs) And and the reason I want to put that out there is because I want our listeners to feel comfortable. Um, I I love to have a wide variety of guests on. Don't... uh, automatically categorize yourself those of you listening in or watching uh, as somebody who is just always going to listen feel free to contribute if you feel like you can speak to a particular topic uh, in a way that is easy to understand for those listening in send us a dm you can just shoot us a dm if you go to instagram.com slash book a podcast let us know what you might be interested in sharing with the audience at large we'll have some back and forth figure out if that works and uh, like we did with jason today we'll make that happen so (laughs) Thanks again, Jason, for reaching out. I'm glad that we made this happen. Yeah, really. That was, um, it was quite the shock in a positive way. It's like, wait, <laughs> me? <laughs> you know? So yeah, this is a lot of fun. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I said this to you before we get started. I'll just throw this out here briefly as well. There is a sure. tendency in our industry to kind of recycle the same photographers on both the, the speaking circuit with conferences and workshops, and then also on podcasts. And mm-hmm. I have a little bit of a um, tendency to, to despise or to dislike copy pasting. And um, I don't just want to simply create a podcast that's rehashing or recycling the same photographers over and over again. And so I love the opportunity that we have here at the podcast to have a wide variety of photographers from kind of all different walks of the industry, different experience levels, different followings. And Mm -hmm. um, so, again, I'm excited to have you here, Jason, for that reason. But based on the information that you sent to us ahead of the episode, it looks like we've got some really great information to get into. We're going to be talking about natural light and boudoir photography, how to handle boudoir photography in the context of natural light. And we'll get mm-hmm. to that here in just a second. Jason, um, first question, as always, brand position. What is the unique value proposition that your business offers to your marketplace? And, and take the opportunity along with that, if you will, just to share with our listeners what your business is and where that is based. Sure, so um, we're based here in uh, California, um, Orange County. And so we, when I say we, it's my wife and myself. Um, I'm a steward of JSEB Boudoir Studios. And what we do is we serve uh, married wives and mothers and provide them with, well, we try to provide them with an uplifting and confidence boosting experience Mm. um, to help them see that they're beautifully and wonderfully made. And how that kind of started out was, um, and I guess I'll touch on this a little bit later, but what makes us different is that I believe I offer a, a male perspective from a photogra- photographer standpoint, uh, but I've also walked the path um, as a husband and as a friend to Jen, my wife, mm. uh, wherein I've walked her through, okay, we've, we've gotten married, right? And also walked her through that stage of pregnancy, now motherhood, 
And the entire time, my perspective of her has just grown uh, more positively through every stage. But for her, it's constantly been shifting because mm. she's had several identity shifts through that process. Mm. Um, and so uh, along the way, it's, it's been very fascinating for me to help her, not just to journey alongside her, but help her regain those aspects of uh, that perspective of herself, of beauty, of courage, of that even though she may be changing, um, my perspective of her is still that she's so beautiful. She's still so wonderful, so important to us, yeah. so significant. Yeah. You know? um, and so that's what we hope to offer uh, to other uh, married wives and mothers uh, in our area. Yeah, and, and I love that perspective. And we will talk a little bit more about it later on in the conversation. But I like that, sure. that this position statement, what you're trying to accomplish, the mission for your business is driven by personal experience because I, I think that at least from personal experience uh, anyway that when that drive the position statement but ultimately the drive for that position statement and the mission associated with a brand comes from a very personal place from personal experience that you can not only maintain a certain level of passion uh, or bring a certain level of passion to interactions with clients potential clients but it also help sustain the business, right? Because especially in your case, Jason, you're talking about something that is, or a concept that is much bigger than just you, just you and your wife. You're talking about many people out there who have these needs, who are going through these struggles. And the fact that you can take part in helping them get to a better place is a really cool concept. Again, a concept that is much bigger than just you and your wife. And right. you actually used the word steward earlier. I'm just curious to get your take on, on that idea. We we've talked about the, the concept of service here before. Why do mm -hmm. you use that particular word, especially as it relates to this genre? Absolutely. Um, a steward is someone who's uh, been tasked to manage, to be put in place, to, to hold something, to have something. Man, let me slow down. Yeah, so. No worries. A yeah, as a steward of Jason Boudoir Studios, I don't like to call myself, I'm, I'm the CEO, I'm the founder, mm. I built this. No, 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 no. Mm. Um, so we're Christian, it's just part of who we are. Sure, and yeah. part of our faith is we believe that uh, uh, if we are called and tasked to, to serve future wives, it, mothers, and married couples, then I need to treat this accordingly. And everybody who steps into this space, mm. um, I, need to honor I need to honor them, I need to honor their time, I need to honor uh, their story and serve them. Um, because it all comes down to service. If like uh, circling back to what you mentioned, Nathan, about uh, having a strong why, uh, without having a strong purpose, um, especially in this niche, uh, it's you when things get difficult and you don't have a strong enough purpose or why, yeah. um, it can make the road more challenging. Very much so. Short. And so, yeah, to your answer, um, we try to humbly serve and I think when we call ourselves the stewards of uh, J. Seb Boudoir Studios, it helps remind us to stay in that um, place of humility, of service uh, for the people that we come across. No, that, that makes sense. And I think I love this idea of service. And, and I come from a very conservative religious background. Um, it's not a mm -hmm. world that I'm actively a part of anymore. But it, the only reason I bring that up is because I know that that word service is much more commonplace. Um, it, service in a I guess in the context of humility, like you were talking about, it's a much more common point of conversation. Um, I, I would venture anyway, at least based on my experience in the religious world versus outside the w religious world. So when we start using that word service, mm. it's, I, I, I think I, I'm just wondering, maybe I'm projecting, but I'm wondering if some people kind of like they cringe a little bit or they're like, wait, wait a minute. What, what are you talking about? Service. Um, mm. I'm a business owner. Like you said, I'm a CEO. I'm the manager. I do this thing. Uh, and I'm not here to, to cater to or to bow down to somebody else. And, and that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about, right. and I, I, th I think you actually use the word humble or humility. What we're talking about is maintaining a sense of humility and an attitude, which is how can I make your life better? How can I add value to you in this, this stage in life where you're at right now? Yes, I'm a photographer. That's the means by which I'm able to serve. And yes. in this case, in the genre of boudoir, but I'm here. How can I make your life better? in this interaction. Exactly. And I, I think that's a lot of it, at least from my perspective. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's um, <laughs> it's because of this podcast that I learned about story brand. And it's like, yeah. you're the hero in the story. How do I come alongside you and give you the tools you need and empower mm. you for this? If it's not the next stage of your life, but in the, in the midst of the valley that you're in, yeah. how do we give you what you need to get out? You know? 
Yes. Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's really good, actually. And for anybody listening in uh, you, who is a regular listener, you would have heard us talk <laughs> about StoryBrand quite a bit. If you haven't yet, you need to get the book. It is one of the most practical, applicable, actionable business books I've ever read, certainly. And the thing that I, I always I tend to tell people when it comes to this book is it's it's like 20% fluff, 80% actionable information, whereas a lot of business books are kind of the flip side of that. And um, oh, so I just, I love that. Can't recommend it enough to anybody listening in. Um, yeah, a little bonus book recommendation there. That's great. Okay, well, I want to keep going. It, it, I think we're sure. going to be able to hit a lot of different topics in a lot of detail, but I want to kind of keep our listeners attentive, if you will. For sure. I want to jump to the yeah. next question. And let's talk a little bit about customer experience. You've already alluded to this. And I just from the little bit of interaction that we've had, Jason, and what you're kind of setting us up with as far as your brand's mission, I, I get a good sense of where you're going with customer service. But is there a big idea or principle that drives that when, when you're thinking about how can I give the best possible experience to my clients? What is the big idea that drives that? What's the big idea that drives it? I mean, it's just from the genuine desire, you know, to, to serve and meet our clients needs. And, and, uh, from that, it's just trying to understand each person's story. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and it's all just relational connection, you know, um, it's in another piece too. It's not just about, um, that individual, like the, the wife or the mother's, uh, struggle, but, and getting them from that perception and help ha helping them release that baggage that they've carried over time. But then there's that second aspect too about the, it, there's a piece of marriage intimacy that, that flourishes from, mm. uh, the, uh, the perception when there's an alignment with how the, the husband and wife see each other, yep. there's something magical. Uh, there's something that happens there, you know, that we've seen yep. through our, our clients experiences, you yep. know, which is cool so to have a part in. Yeah. And it's almost like, okay, yeah, you did this for yourself. Um, but then there's also other things that happen along the way, you know, and that's just a bonus. Cool. Very, very cool. Well, I mm -hmm. want to shift gears yet again, though. Let me ask you sure. about time management and you alluded to your wife and your family. How yes. do you go about creating, making sure that you're consistently creating space for them? And, and I, as much as our culture is obsessed right now with this phrase self care, um, I, I I think we've kind of gone over the top with it, but I think there's significance to that too. I know that I need a break mentally, physically, emotionally from work pretty consistently, or I'm not going to be able to bring my A game, right? And so uh -huh. we, we need to give ourselves space, but certainly we need to make space for the important people in our lives. And I'm curious if, if there's a big idea that drives your ability to manage time effectively in that regard. For sure. It's actually, if I could plug another book. Um, Please. It's called, yeah, it's uh, The On Purpose Person. Okay. And... I mean, we hear it all the time, set your priorities, set boundaries. But uh, for me, it, it just, that book helped rephrase it in a different way, which is, and we kind of talked about it before, is have a strong why. What, what's most important to you? And what I took from that book is my actions show those around me, my wife and my daughter in particular, what I value and what's most important. And like a quick example is if you're at home at dinner time, right? Especially nowadays with, you know, we have our phones everywhere with us yeah. if you have your phone and your child or your wife is talking to you and you're just scrolling uh-huh yeah yeah and what 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 message does that communicate you know and so um i slow down and really me when started... i see that like when we go out to restaurants and and i'm, yeah. I'm watching whether it's mothers with their kids or couples yes. or otherwise and they're literally like face in their phone when they have the opportunity to sit there and i i know and it's connect it's so sad. I hate it. And, yes, and I, I've right. become so cognizant of it. Then like when I'm out on a date with Jill, for example, I, I will very intentionally, if I have my phone out, I tend to make sure that I'm like actually showing her that screen. Cause I don't want it to be this, like, I'm not here hanging this out on my bubble. phone while she's, yeah, I just, uh -huh. Oh, it's so, it's, it's so cringy. Yeah. I, that's exactly what I was thinking. And so I think part of that is just knowing what my, my why is, which is my family. Um, and showing that and how, how do I walk that out? It's, you know, structure and boundaries. So um, I have a mixture of, uh, I use Google tasks. I've got my Google calendar here with me and um, uh, daily reminders, honestly, um, just to keep me on task with the things that I have to do. And like you said, if you don't take those breaks that you need to, then, oh my gosh, you're, you're just going to get gassed um, after several hours of work. Um, and then lastly, too, in regards to priorities, like logistically speaking, once it gets closer to like 5 p.m., I already know it's time to shift gears. Um, five, 5 to 9 p.m. is family time, absolutely no matter what. And if it, 
any time after that, you know, if, if it comes to photography work or planning for the next day, then that's what I got to do. But 5 to 9 p.m. is absolutely family time. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the, the intentionality and then a, just a little bit of structure. It yes. doesn't have to be complicated. You talked about Google Calendar, Google Tasks. I will say that yes. you might be the first photographer to bring up Google Tasks as a task management mm -hmm. system on the podcast in over 500 episodes, oh. which is a little <laughs> bit surprising, honestly. But it, it's, it's a system that exists in the background and I've played with it over the years because I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to task and project management systems. <laughs> sure. So I'm curious, just very quickly, Google Tasks, totally. why that piece of software versus any other system out there? Well, since I use, you know, Gmail and like the Google suite already, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've always wanted to find like, I didn't want to use um, uh, other apps. I wanted something that was integrated uh, within the Google suite. So yes. you can just pull up your Google calendar and the Google Tasks, like you said, it's just hidden on the side there. But um, you can have repeating tasks, you can set up, um, and I love checklists, you know, it's just something just feels good, you know, when you can cross something <laughs> off or check it off and, yeah. and it like, it's got this cool like animation that it goes away, you know, so um, you can look at it uh, alongside your Gmail or alongside, and I'm looking at it right now, um, alongside your calendar. Uh, so I found it just, it's, it's all integrated into one place. So it's, it's more effective and efficient for me. I like that a lot, actually. Yeah, the, the less moving parts that we have in not only our personal lives, but certainly our business. Mm. I mean, there's so much to keep up with the sole proprietors. And so the idea that we're at continuing to add all these different pieces of software to the mix just right. further complicates things. So, yeah, I, I love that. I, I think finding any ways that we can simplify and minimize, I like to say to my team, minimize the number of moving parts. That's, like that. that's the goal. And, and the reality is there are some things that just simply are complicated. You know, Photoshop has a lot of different moving parts. It is complicated. Yes. And in, in that case, then you figure out kind of that 80, 20 principle, what is most helpful in achieving the goals, the specific goals that I have. But mm -hmm. yeah, at the end of the day, let's try to minimize the number of moving parts. And that's a, that's a great recommendation actually based on, uh, on that. So I, I guess yep. again, shifting directions just a little bit, when we talk about time management, and sure. it certainly as it comes to or as it relates to managing time for the sake of space in our lives as business owners, delegation is something that we talk about quite a bit here on the podcast. It's one of the most effective ways to save time. And I'm curious if you've experimented with this principle in your business, if you find any success with it. Uh, at this time, it's since we're so new with launching our boudoir business, mm. um, it's, it's just a one man show, you know, okay. just spinning a bunch of different plates. It's all yep. just me right now. Okay. Um, but just like with listening to everything you're saying, it, it has gotten me thinking like, okay, once, uh, other pieces are built up in our business and the foundation is set, um, should we, uh, look toward outsourcing photo editing or what about social media management? Mm. Oh my gosh, Nathan, it's such a daily thing this social yes. media management it's not a joke um no. and along with the web design email marketing the accounting there's just so many uh, aspects to it so um i'm definitely hopeful um god willing we do get to that place that would be an amazing thing mm -hmm. and just to be able to bring more people on board who share the mission and vision and we can just push it forth together you know so do you think just kind of curious to, to get your take on this generally speaking because i know a lot of photographers have various apprehensions when it comes to the idea of delegation. Certainly editing is the one that, that always pops up because it's almost like the most obvious and it's probably the most time consuming of anything we do in our business as mm -hmm. photographers. But whether it's that, um, you know, email management, album design, um, sure. social media management, especially with all the different platforms to keep up with right now, what's the, in your mind, from your perspective, kind of the, the barrier to entry and beginning that process of delegation? what is the barrier to entry for the process of delegation? It could be, could be several things. It could be, like you said, fear or apprehension. Mm. Um, it could also just be um, budget as well. Okay. I think that could be a big one um, uh, for, for, for many uh, entrepreneurs. Um, but like going back to what you're saying in terms of editing, there could be that thought in a photographer where it's like, oh, but this is my editing style. But after uh, listening to uh, the thoughts that you've, you've, uh, shared with like through many podcasts, it's, there's a science and there's a formula for lack of better words. And there's a, it, it's teachable. That's what I'm trying to say. It's a teachable thing. You can teach someone how to edit your style. And I think that could be a very, um, beneficial and helpful thing for someone who is the, uh, the main CEO or founder. Um, it can give that person the ability to do other things. Um, if somebody can just focus on that one specific area, which in this case, it would just be photo editing, for example. Right. 
Well, and I'll, I'll give a little shameless plug here to photographers that at my company as well, because our, our specialty is matching photographers style. So okay. um, I know that, that the idea of delegation of editing one of probably the two biggest apprehensions are cost. You talk about budget and then the others, the other is that, that the control the main maintaining control of the editing style and, and the finished work that goes out. Mm -hmm. Our company specializes in that. So that's actually what we're out to do is to match photographers style. The budget piece is it, it can be a little bit challenging, you know, especially when you're you're in a place. Um, and for that matter, I am even now, too. I'm super thankful for what sure. I have financially. But in, internally, I'm like, OK, how can I maximize the amount of cash that I'm saving? Right. Exactly. And, right. and so there is a tendency to think, OK, 200 bucks I can save here or 50 bucks there or 100 bucks there if I do right. this editing myself. I totally get that thought process. But then the question, I guess, not just to yourself, Jason, but to, to sure. all of our listeners would be, what then could you do with that additional free time? And a lot of photographers will say, well, I'm just building my business. But if you're building your business, if you didn't have to do the editing, then what could you do to actually then go and build your business? Because now you're not having to edit for an hour or three hours, five hours, sure. however much time it takes. So I'll just throw right. that food for thought out there. It's not meant to be a commercial for photographers edit totally. um, to you, but, but um, it, generally speaking, especially again for our listeners and viewers, I think it's good to kind of at least think through some of those things because at the end of the day, if we want to create a, a business that's not only growing, but gives us as much freedom and space as possible, I think we have to think about delegation, not just with editing, any element of our business. Mm -hmm. yeah, to, to your point, it's, um, it would help, I think, for all of us to stop and slow down. Like, okay, yeah, if I did um, invest, and I think that would be the right language for us is to say, if I invested this mm. time to put aside for social media management, what can I be doing in that hour, hour and a half and make use of it and not, you know, I'm a gamer too. So it's like, instead of yeah. just playing video games in that time, like, like what would I, what, what can I do to, to further the business? You know, that's well, yeah, but you know, if you want to game a little bit, now you have some, some time to do that. What, what's your <laughs> yes, favorite you to play? Like top couple of games that you oh. like to play. Oh gosh. Uh, lately, um, I'm a big Witcher fan. So okay. the Witcher yeah. three hands down. Um, okay. and the one I want to be social and, uh, play with friends it would be like overwatch apex legends you know and okay. classic call of duty yeah <laughs> of to, course to name a few yeah. okay that's cool mm -hmm. well okay so let's just kind of transition a little bit i guess to something slightly different in this case um talk to me a little bit about and we've actually already mentioned a couple of them self-help book business book a book that's made okay. a big impact on your life can you can you think of another one that you haven't mentioned yet sure um have you heard of the e-myth revisited absolutely one of my favorites yeah, it's a, a big one for me um, that's helped me like, understand that uh, as a photographer, you can't just <laughs> be a photographer and just be good with holding the camera and posing yeah. and know the lighting. That's the technical aspect of it. Um, you have to also, it's, it's equally important to learn all the other aspects of the business, um, PR, brand awareness. Um, gosh, I've got these books staring at me right now on my desk called Instant Cash Flow. Just you know, revenue and, and, and the accounting, just pretty much we can go on for days, like sales conversion. There's so many other aspects to it. Um, and the why behind why, the, the reason why it's been so impactful for me is it's challenged me to uh, embrace the process of learning the, the business aspect of it. Um, and I think once we're able to get there and have that understanding of like, oh, cool, I want to climb that mountain, so to speak. And oh, okay, it's once the fog clears and there's actually so much more to it. Well, okay, cool. There's, there's other people, there's a large community um, here on the Boca podcast, online on Facebook. There's so many resources that we have that people are willing to come alongside us to, yeah. to help us walk that mountain too, because people have been there or doing it with you, you know? Well, I, when I think back about that book, and I read it a number of years ago, yeah, I think about the concept of sustainability. Actually, two mm -hmm. words, sustainability and scalability, right? So how are we creating a business? And this relates very much actually to the conversation we were just having. Delegation is an element of creating a sustainable, scalable business. Great if we're point. building a business that doesn't require us to have our hands in literally everything, it yes. is going to not only be scalable and that we can build it larger because it doesn't, it's not now just, we're not a bottleneck as that business of one. Right. And then it's also sustainable in that we can continue that growth and continue to, to put the kind of same the same kind of energy that we put into now because we've got systems in place that en enable us to do that more efficiently. And mm -hmm. so I think that's super important. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything you said, it's um, if it's just you doing everything, you're going to burn out like so fast. <laughs> well, and, and while we're um, I'm actually going to pull this up, I've I pulled up my. Uh, 
my browser here. So, oops, now as I'm searching for it, Emeth Revisited. There Michael it is. Michael Gerber? Yep, is that... Michael Gerber is, is the author. And I, I wanted to pull this up on screen so we could actually look at it t together with everybody. Uh, nice. I actually pulled up On Purpose Person earlier, so we'll, I'll pop that up here in just a second. But yeah, Emeth Revisited. Uh, and it looks like I actually purchased it in 2007. So maybe that's when I actually <laughs> bought the, uh, the, the last copy of it, but why most small businesses don't work and what to do about it. The original was called the e myth. And this is a, basically mm -hmm. an updated version of that. And I highly mm -hmm. recommend it for anybody listening in who actually wants to build a business for the long haul. That is a, a really, really important book to read. And then I'll, I'll also mention the one uh, that was brought up earlier, The On Purpose Person, because this is a new one for us here at the show, Making Your Life Make Sense by Kevin McCarthy. For anybody to live stream, you can see that on screen as well. And I really appreciate the, those recommendations. That's great. Yeah, sure. Anytime. <laughs> okay, so one more question before we get into the topic today about natural light boudoir photography. Favorite sure. piece of gear in your camera bag at the moment? What's the thing that comes to mind? So I have a Canon R6. Um, it's hard. It's hard to say, but I have an adapted Nikon 50 millimeter 1.8 manual lens. Um, and I, I had to choose that over the 24 to 70 FT weight that I shoot with just because, really? I mean, it, it was made in the eighties. Mm -hmm. um, it's fully manual. It's all metal. Sorry to nerd out on everybody, but it just has a certain character about it that yeah. newer lenses just can't replicate. Like, um, the, the, the Canon RF glass, it's like so clean, so, I dare I say, like sterile, you know, it's just so clean. <laughs> you know what you're yeah. going to get. It's going to be super sharp and on point. That's and, true. Um, but then it's just, there's a certain quality that this, you know, uh, this vintage lens really captures, you know. Um, so I'd have to say, I, I have to go with that, that 80, well, yeah, that 50 millimeter Nikon. Just got it. Yeah. I feel you on that. I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but I've got a twin lens camera, a Yashica twin lens medium format camera. And okay. the bokeh, the number of things I like about the camera, it's certainly you know, the metallic feel and everything is completely yes. manual. But you're talking about this lens and the character of the lens, the bokeh that that particular lens creates, it's a circular mm. bokeh that is just mm -hmm. beautiful. And, and I've blown up prints from that camera for clients up to like um, 30 by 30 or 40 by 40 uh, images of, of clients that I've photographed. And to see yeah. that circular bokeh at that size is just, it's the coolest it's like thing. Stunning. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll totally nerd out with you on the gear. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing. It's just, yeah, the bokeh is just incredible, you know? Um, but yeah, enough of that. Enough of that. So it's the 50 mil. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, and by the way, I just want to encourage everybody who's listening and, and streaming um, to not to hesitate to comment, to ask questions as we go through this conversation, especially about natural light boudoir photography. Um, we're going to get into... To, to the weeds a little bit. I don't mean that in a negative way, like technical stuff here. And I think that's really great for those who are either new in photography or even established. Um, I had a comment earlier from, from uh, a user there on, or a viewer on YouTube, delegating is a good point. I need to do more of that. And, um, and then I answered the question about the author of the E-Myth book. Um, I'm, I'm so glad, and I wish I knew your name so I could actually call you by name, but thanks for chiming in, asking questions, and don't be shy, those of you who are live streaming on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, at Boca Podcast to engage in the conversation. We, we love to make this a group conversation. Jason, to that end, I want to kind of transition sure. to our topic at hand. How long, first okay. of all, just to give context to our listeners, how long have you been photographing boudoir? Unofficially, five to six years ago, but officially I started the beginning of last year when I started reaching out to um, our local community. Uh, Jen and I have continually talked about it um, several times as we've, you know, like we mentioned before, walked through marriage together and you know, um, have those conversations of how did that make you feel, you know, mm -hmm. um, as we walked through it together. And once the timing was right, uh, we just went for it. And now we're here. Which is great. And, and you talked about how that then relates to your mission earlier. And in fact, I actually want to yes. bring up your your website here. And for everybody who is not live streaming, um, this is one of the benefits, of course, of live streaming, be able to kind of see the visuals to go along with the discussion. Don't hesitate to go back to youtube.com slash Boca podcast or facebook.com slash Boca podcast and you can watch the replay. Uh, there's a little statement here on your site, Jason, that says you are one photo shoot away from seeing your true beauty and worth. And, right. um, and then up above, you talked about your position statement earlier, luxury boudoir photography for wives and mothers. And that means you too. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> you also talk about the backstory that you alluded to earlier regarding right. your wife and how this ultimately benefited your wife and, of course, your relationship um, doing, uh, offering this photography sure. to your wife. 
And, and it, it's kind of a segue to a question, something that we haven't really addressed here on the, on the podcast. I think, um, well, certainly a number of the, the boudoir photographies that we've had on the show have been female. Sure. Um, or maybe mm-hmm. not necessarily in a relationship, male or female. But I'm curious in the context of a relationship with your wife and a, and a seemingly a very intentional one, a good one. How, how do you handle the trust factor as a male photo- a photographer photographing boudoir? Sure. Would it be helpful too? Because I think the backstory of how we got there. Um, Please. Uh, yeah, sure. So it started with, um, I think we talked about is our journey of marriage and, and uh, our journey through parenthood. A lot of the times Jen was uh, dismissive with the compliments I gave her, you know, and mm. I would try to remind her every single morning as we'd get ready for, for work, like, oh my gosh, you look amazing. Love the way that you did your hair. And it was always like, Oh, you or <laughs> oh, oh, you're cute. You're supposed to say that you're my husband, you know, and I was just sure. like, it's like, oh, that hurt. Like, wait, hang on. Like, and, you know, that that would happen um, kind of consistently, you know, and yeah. um, I, I can't, by we, the way, I feel your pain, Jason. Sure. I'm, I'm a almost an over complimenter, I think. Um, uh-huh. to, to my girlfriend and um, I, I, I realized, okay, maybe the impact I can maximize the impact if I, if I pull back just a little bit and don't tell her as much as I'm thinking of it. Cause I'm thinking it nonstop. I'm like, Oh my word, absolutely stunning. Um, right. But, but yeah, I, I feel your pain there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. And so what was interesting was trying to get more intentional with the compliments too. Right. But then actually slowing down one day and I was like, hang on, why do you respond that way? And she was like, what do you mean? And when she really started to slow down and really think about it, it's like, wait, I, it's because I don't believe what you're saying, you know? And mm. um, we started really unpacking a lot more. There was so much under there. It was like the iceberg, you know? And um, what we were able to discover was, you know, her entire life, social media, media, magazines, billboards, even, you know, people we know in our social circles, there's, there's a, uh, whether it's overt or subtle, there's always something messaging that, um, she was uh, being surrounded by as to how she was, was supposed to look, hmm. the kind of clothes she was supposed to wear, um, m- makeup, hairstyle, you name it. And so uh, now here comes me, husband, who's like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. You're so beautiful. You're incredible. And it's like, no, I don't believe anything you're saying. And so it kind of evolved where it's like, okay, so it really doesn't matter what I say. So you need to say that about yourself. How do we get you to that place then? Hmm. Um, because I clearly see it. And so it was almost like, and I get so emotional and passionate talking about this because hmm. it's like, I wish I could just show you how I feel about you, yeah. what I see in you, yeah. and not just physically, but everything else that comes yep. alongside it. So, Absolutely. and just a quick segue, we used to love watching, you know, Victoria's Secret fashion shows and just the whole glitz and glamour about it. And so one day I was thinking, you know what? You like that so much, I'm gonna challenge you. Let me shoot you. Mm -hmm. Um, Let me capture you because you can do that. And let's up the ante even more. No Photoshop, no nothing. Like I'll put all the work on me. I'm just going to tell you what to do and let's see what happens. And she's like, fine, I will take your challenge. Let's do it. She leaned into it. We took some several images and I just showed her the back of the camera. Like, look, there's no Photoshop there. Mm. That's all you. And the way that she just lit up and was like, wait, that's me? what how'd you do that and i'm like i didn't do any <laughs> i didn't do anything you know yeah. and that was the end of it um mm. get, it, i think it just gave her a glimpse like just uh just a little idea of the way that i saw her you know and um after that experience it was just like she was more confident you know like there was like this pep in her step and it's like yeah. yep that's who i see every day you yeah. know yeah that's really really and cool s- and so so I mean, think, your, your mission is yeah. ultimately then to, to bring that. And, and I love that you kind of built on the story that you alluded to earlier with those details, because I mean, I can, I can sense the excitement, the, the passion from you about this, about this topic. And ultimately mm-hmm. that, that experience is what you're trying to bring then to other women as well. hundred percent. Yeah. And, um, I think circling back, it's not just about breaking the walls of lies that she's taken and built up in herself. Um, but now it's just rebuilding her self image to that place of joy and courage, beauty and strength. And, and it also will help, um, couples, uh, heal aspects of their marriage that they may not have even known needed to be healed. Mm. Um, and so in addition to that, I think, uh, and I can end with this, it's, we've felt that, uh, the world has distorted, 
um, intimacy and reduce it to like a money making addiction machine. And, and it relegates the human body and, and uh, these kinds of images to something so much smaller than what it was supposed to be. So we want to be able to celebrate it in what we feel is the context that it can be celebrated yeah. um, within the confines or in the context of marriage and then help uh, married couples also celebrate that intimacy, one, couple, one client and one couple at a time. I love how you made the correction there from confines to context of marriage. Yes. <laughs> Good Ooh, catch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, it's not confined. We no, won't read into that too much. Okay. <laughs> okay. So just very quickly, I want to bring it around to my, my original question though trust. about trust. Yeah. So talk yes. to me about that as it relates to your relationship with your wife. Absolutely. And so it, it all starts again at purpose and what's the why behind everything. Okay. Um, having, you know, being a husband and now a girl dad, um, there's a lot of responsibility that we feel that I feel we carry in terms of getting them both to feel seen, safe and known. And if you have that strong why, then what it means is it'll it'll outpour in your how. So um, what that would look like is being able to uh, communicate openly with my wife on the images, on the clients that we're going to uh, service um, sure. and help. Um, for example, just this past week, um, we had two clients come in and uh, Jen and I had open conversations of, okay, what do you think about this mood board? This is the kind of vision that we want to create for them. Um, and then also having a, um, a questionnaire as well on the client side as well. And I can touch more on this later about their comfort level, you know? And um, so Jen and I, yeah, we do have our personal boundaries of, uh, for example, do we want to shoot nude? What about mm -hmm. implied nude? What about mm -hmm. topless? And mm -hmm. um, making sure that she and my vision aligns in terms of the kind of images that we want to deliver. So okay. um, I think it's just that, honestly, that open communication, um, it helps build that trust. With, with the clarity to go along with that of the sure. mission, like you were pointing out, I think that's, that's really important. What's the intention, the reason why we're even doing this to begin with? Yeah, exactly. that, that's super important. I love that. I love, I love the intention. I'm going to use the word, it is a little bit of cliche, but it, I love the intentionality behind uh, both the mission and then also yes. the open communication between the two of you. I, right. I think that's just so important for the sake of maintaining trust. And, and that's really great. I want to kind of shift though to totally. what we were going to discuss as it relates to boudoir photography, natural light. Um, before we yeah. get into some of the technical elements of your photography, what was mm -hmm. the driving factor behind focusing on natural light versus using sure. studio lights or otherwise? Absolutely. Um, so before we dove into photo, uh, excuse me, in, into boudoir photography, um, I had experience using um, strobes with umbrellas and uh, soft boxes, and I used to do product photography uh, before we made the switch. So um, outside of just the big production and, you know, all the different lights and mm -hmm. the backdrops and stuff, um, I love the drama that you can create. But once I discovered that similar images can be achieved with much less, I honestly, I just fell in love with that idea of, being able to manipulate natural light in the space that you're given. Yeah. Um, and I just took off with that. And I think from the client's perspective, I, I, I got their feedback about, um, I, I just asked them one time uh, through their different sessions, uh, how would you feel um, if we had umbrellas in this place, if we had backdrops and this and that? And for a lot of them, it was like, you know, I'd be really intimidated. You know, it's already a very, um, intimate uh, experience that we're already having True. but with such a big production with all these lights it can get more intense it's already in intense as it is but for sure when i show up with you know my dinky uh what you call it um camera body and this a small little 50 mil it's like yeah. this is all we're using today you know and they're like they kind of give you that face of no way this <laughs> is that really is that it i'm like yeah just trust the process you know i, I love just that you know I, I like encouraging them with that and i've noticed it's um it's lessen the intimidation. Um, and it's also, you know, after just showing them one image, Nathan, on the back of the camera with that little lens, you know, it's their they're they're confidence just launches. Yeah, exactly. That's really cool. That's really cool. And I, I love the backstory there because the stereotype with quote unquote natural light photographers is, oh, you were too lazy to actually make the effort to learn lighting. Right. And mm -hmm. instead, you actually already had that background and you chose to go a different direction for the reasons mm -hmm. that you shared. And, and I think that's really cool. By the way, I just want to throw this up on screen. Um, our earlier commenter says, my name is Alex and I love that backstory with your wife. Thanks, Alex, Thank for, you. for chiming in. And uh, again, for those others who are live streaming right now, don't be shy. Come on, join in, comment, ask questions. We want your involvement in this conversation, but we're going to keep going. So 
favorite elements of or yeah. characteristics of natural light. You were talking about uh, the, I think mood was one word that you used, uh, yeah. creating a similar look and feel to using studio lights or strobe lights. But sure. is there like one or two big characteristics, if you will, of natural light that, that come to mind? Um, let me think. Well, I don't know if it's specific to natural light, but maybe it's like the client's, I guess it's tied in. It, it's the client response. It's honestly everything. Um, Cause it's kind of like I build it up during, during the hair and makeup process. And it's like, so this is all we're going to use. And this is the space we've got. And we're going to use that window right there. And we're going to create some epic images, you know, and they kind of don't believe you, you know? And um, when you just go through that process of actually um, making spectacular, dark, moody, contrasty images that evoke, you know, tension and emotion and passion um, in a very, uh, uh, sensual yet um, glamorous, classy way, uh, I just love seeing it. I wish I could capture that uh, while I show it to them, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think another thing, another favorite characteristic I would say is uh, you can take the sun with you anywhere. <laughs> um, the versatility of the light, you could shoot like in an Airbnb, a hotel room, bedrooms, living rooms. Um, you're not limited. And as it's, of course, as long as you have a decent window, a decently sized window and good window light, then and if you know the uh, the principles of how to manipulate it, then you're good to go. Um, and we're going to talk yeah. about those principles here in just a little bit. Um, I have I will add just a little caveat though. Sure. You live in California. You all have, especially Orange County, stunning uh -huh. light there, pretty consistently throughout the yes. year. So you're you're pretty <laughs> lucky <true>. for that. <laughs> That's true. It seems pretty sunny there though. You know. At the moment, fortunately, yeah. This is right <laughs> now. What it looks like is what you all have like 95 percent of the time. This is what we have maybe 40 percent of the time. So <laughs> That's true. It might I'm be a little, a little bit, biased then. It's yeah, skewed, I'm a little yeah. bit jealous. Um, you were talking about your style of photography though, and I want to pull up your Instagram account for those of you who are live streaming. Sure. You can see this. And it is JSE Boudoir on Instagram. We'll link to it in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. I'm just scrolling through here slowly. You can see a little sampling of Jason's work and, of course, the use of natural light. I, I love the subtlety, for example, of this image. Uh, and this is a post for those of you listening on audio uh, on January 22nd that Jason posted this. But just a super, super subtle light just kind of flowing across her back there creates wonderful texture. You're, you're allowing there to be darkness in the photo, which creates right. some depth and some mood and a little bit of curiosity, which is also really, really well done. So Thank you obviously you. are shooting with intention here. And I want to get into the the technical side of things. And honestly, we okay. don't we don't deal a lot in the technical side of photography uh, okay. for multiple reasons. Our, our podcast tends to be focused on the business side of things. So I like that we're doing this today. And I'll, I'll break the fourth wall for everybody listening in. Jason actually <laughs> initially... Uh, had planned on sharing his screen and this very fancy diagram explaining the technical so elements bad. behind. <laughs> Not at all. It's actually really impressive. Um, I, I like I, I like the, the planning and also the, the attention to detail, the technical detail there, I think is really, really great. But um, be, before we get to the kind of driving principles that help you with that, do mention, if sure. you will, I mean, you talk about what you love so much about natural light, the challenges that you're ultimately overcoming with your technical ability. What are those? Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. So it's winter time, winter time here in California right now. Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but sometimes you just want to nail a certain shot with the sunlight coming through the blinds, but cloud cover means no sun rays. Okay. Got to change up, you know, um, the mood of the images today. And just, you, you're almost forced to have that flexibility in your mood board and your planning phase. Um, another thing too, like for example, uh, winter versus summer, um, the sun's path is different. So the type of shots that I would tend mm. to get in my space are going to be very different. Um, like for example, I would tell my clients to arrive, like we would start shooting at 10, but 10 a.m. in the summer versus 10 a.m. now uh, in February is very different in terms of, like we said, like the sun rays coming in. Um, and a year ago when I started, I wouldn't have known that um, until, you know, the seasons had changed. So time of year, weather, uh, and then also you are limited to that 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, kind of, um, I guess, the, the daylight factor. Sure. Um, I think it'd be very challenging to ask a client, at least in my um, one year of experience, to say, all right, arrive at my place at 7 in the morning. Um, we're going to get your hair and makeup done. So I'm trying to be reasonable with that, you know. <laughs> um, so come over at our place at 9. Maybe 8 is pushing it, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. But of course, like having somebody come in at 5 p.m., it's just not going to work. Right. 
yeah, you're losing quite a bit of light, especially absolutely um, earlier in the year. Uh, before we get to those again, the principles. I keep teasing it. We're going to talk about principles that drive your ability as a natural light photographer, boudoir photography. But I had a couple of questions come in on on YouTube. Tell it well. Photography okay. says, "What is your approach to create tension and yet stay classy at the same time?" So that's one question. And then the second question, also, what expectations do you set with your clients before the session? Sure, I think the approach would just be. It depends on the image um, and the mood you're trying to create. So with Nathan, like with that last image that you showed, um, I like that we're showing you know, the, the client's back. And it's almost, I, I, I always try to have that vision of if I were the husband looking at my wife coming through, um, looking at her, like what's happening in this picture, you know? And, and uh, the intentionality behind this is you could still see her face just so subtly, you know? And um, I think there's, it's part just with the play of the darkness and the light. But then also it's, I think there's a misconception too, Nathan, with specifically with boudoir is I need to be naked or I need to mm. be more revealing or show so much. But mm. that's what, what I'm hoping to challenge those aspects or those uh, misconceptions as well. It's no, like she's fully clothed there, but there's what, what's actually happening. Yes. Thank you. That's the yeah. word. There's suggestion. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, that's, I think, and I think, you know, there's, there's kind of a fun challenge innate to that. Like you're, you're setting what we might call a parameter. Um, yeah. within which you're photographing, which, you know, whether or not you end up shooting nudes or not, in this case, you're not photographing a client in a nude. And so right. you're wanting to create that sense of tension, but you're doing that within the context of she still has some clothing on. How do Absolutely. I create tension? And that, that, pe that suggestion piece creates tension. That's, that's brilliant. Yes. And, and that photograph just brilliantly, I'll pull it back up on screen here, just brilliantly exemplifies that really, really well done. And then, then that that's second it. question, um, which is what expectations do you set with your clients before sure. the session? What, is, what are those? Absolutely. Um, actually, that would be something I know um, uh, we could touch on that later. Cause, um, Perfect. Yeah, great. Fair enough. We'll come back to that then. And actually, well, the little just, teaser. Well, yeah, we'll segue into really my next question and kind of my primary question here driving this conversation, which is the top most important principles that photographers should keep in mind based on your experience, Jason, for powerful natural light boudoir sessions and photography. What, what would those big principles be? For sure. Um, to give you guys a, uh, a bullet list outline, number one would just be absolutely get to know your client even before, way, way before they even step into your space. Number two, um, over communicate. And that's where the setting expectations, like uh, to your question, um, how do you set expectations for your client? That would be the way to do it, over communicate. Step three, master your poses, absolutely master your poses. And then number four, know your lighting, know your light triangles. Um, so going back to it, number one, getting to know your client before they even step into your space, uh, especially as a male photographer, um, it's trust and respect. You have to earn it, especially with such an intimate and vulnerable niche. Mm. It's absolutely important. I, I can't stress that or overemphasize that enough. Mm. Um, and the way to do that, as I mentioned before, is, you know, stepping into this profession and this niche with the right purpose, uh, with a strong why that your clients can resonate with because again, the bottom line is we are here to serve them. And so again, just harping on that trust, they need to be able to feel comfortable with you. Um, and yeah, it's just, it comes in just that, that prep work and communication, which is to the second, uh, bullet point. And, and before you, before you yeah, go, go to that second point, Jason, a question about that. Cause sure. when I think about, you make a, a great point, which is we're, we're talking about photographing super intimate portraits and sure usually it's people are, that are coming to us that don't know us from Adam, right? Like there's just no, there's no kind of connection in that way. So right. they're jumping right into a very intimate, I'm going to call it a relationship. It's a working relationship, totally. but a very intimate relationship just immediately. And the question right. is, how do you set the tone that enables that sense of trust that you're talking about? And maybe mm -hmm. this is just me, but subjective preference, but is there... I think about even like the moment that door opens and they come in for the meeting, the initial sure. emotion that you bring to the interaction, the way that the warmth and the tone of your voice, um, the way Absolutely. that maybe you reach out to shake their hand or give them a hug or whatever yes. it is, that Absolutely. initial that 30 seconds, we'll call it. Do you, do you yes. think about that when you meet with these clients? Oh, a hundred percent. It's um, especially when it comes to uh, meeting them outside and not, like you said, um, I like to go outside to meet them and help them come in. 
Um, I think it's like those little things that you mentioned uh, make a big difference. And along the way, it's also just, I think for me, since it is, I, I guess we could call it like a cold call kind of a conversation or yeah. a relationship leading up to it, it's sending out questionnaires to gain important information, sending out pre-shoot checklists, sending out outfit guides and suggestions. And, and I think the big thing too, and um, for us, it's share, continually sharing our story and our why and asking them like, what do they think about it? What do you think about it? And what, what made you choose us, you know? Um, and of course, once they're actually in the studio space, the, the other part is, um, let's say if they're changing, giving them space and communicating at every aspect. Okay, this is what's going mm -hmm. to happen at, at this point. You're going mm -hmm. to get your hair and makeup done. Mm -hmm. um, then I'm going to be here in present at this time. Um, then you're going to get changed over there in, in, in the restroom, in your dressing room. Um, and we're gonna go from there. And it's also uh, for us uh, male uh, photographers that the language that you use as well yeah. is very important during yeah. the posing process. Mm. Um, for example, uh, just saying like, move your hips toward the light, um, arch, arch your lower back this way, and then walking them through the process and uh, angle your chest more toward the ceiling, what have you. Um, female photographers may be able to get away with using other kind of language. Sure. Um, as some of your guests have mentioned before, you know? Yeah. Um, but, and, and I think another big thing as well is also sharing with them, um, there may be a time, uh, there may be a, a moment where I may struggle communicating how I want you to pose. So with your permission, always, you know, getting used to saying that with your permission, 100%. may I move your knee or yeah. your angle, uh, your ankle or tap this part or just adjust your hair for you just to, yeah. to show you, you yeah. know, it's, it's, again, it's all in that, the, the communication over communicate over communication yeah which uh man okay so different directions we could go here let's let's actually just kind of continue down the line so we were talking sure. about over communicating uh, certainly throughout the session and I, I love that you make that a priority and i've said this multiple times on the podcast before i think photographers in, in many cases and i'm sure i've been guilty of it too don't communicate enough and whether it's a boudoir session or just a family portrait session sure. the people the people or the person in front of the camera in many cases, if not most cases, are not used to being photographed. So right. it's on us to create an environment and let's kind of set aside this notion that we're introverts or whatever other label we want to give ourselves. Sure. The importance is what you were saying from the very beginning of the conversation, Jason, which is to serve this client to create the best possible environment for them. How do we do exactly. that? One of the, the most important ways is to communicate and to do so nonstop. And that mm -hmm. helps alleviate that tension. Is there are there any particular phrases that you think are super helpful? And I know that we're going to get into posing here in just a second, sure. but when it comes to the yeah. actual communications, talking them through it, are there any particular phrases that you have found particularly helpful in the process of communication? Um, are you to clarify, do you mean specifically during the actual shoot or before or after? Or Fair question. Yeah. Of? That was kind of a vague way to, to ask it. I, well, let's start first all of good. all with, with, um, it, when they come into the studio before you actually start photographing, when you're kind of explaining, walking them through the process, it wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. have to be phrases, but any particular ideas that you have found have been helpful in creating that environment of trust, uh, before you actually right. get to shooting. Oh, absolutely. It would always begin with, okay, this is where you set your stuff. You know, of course, you welcome them in, ask how, you know, the traffic was just, you know, that good old small talk, you know, build the rapport and then yeah. walk them into the space, welcome the space. Um, and hopefully you've prepared it in advance for them. Um, and then showing them where the shoot's going to be. So this is location one, this is location two and three. Um, and then walking them, literally walking them through and giving them a tour so that they're just not like, okay, what's happening? Where am I? What, yeah, you're just giving them a bearing of where everything is. And yeah. um, I think for me, that's been very helpful, just having that routine in place. Okay. And then from there, um, going through the steps of, okay, this is what's going to happen next. So your hair and makeup artist is going to um, take care of you now. And then afterwards, you're going to change. And um, yeah, those are essentially the phrases that I would use. And okay. then I would even uh, go back, circle back to the questionnaire that they've previously filled out. Mm -hmm. um, because in my mind, the why behind that, uh, for those of us listening, is it, I think it does two things. It, it continues with that aspect of communication. But then secondly, I think hopefully it would show them, oh, wow, you're on it. Like, you really paid attention. And you're right. I, I, I did write that I was uncomfortable about doing that thing. But now I'm not. And that just, that just happened yesterday where they, I make a point to ask, like, okay, um, for my clients, um, 
sometimes they actually wanted me to push them in terms of their courageous level, you know, and after mm. the fact, when, once a session was over, it's like, yeah, I actually would have wanted to try implied newt. And I was, Jason, I was waiting for you to ask. And, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I hadn't even uh, realized that. So it's okay. a question that I added into the questionnaire uh, to say, like, you know, um, this has happened to me before, but just in case in the moment, if there's a vision that I may have, uh, my dear client, that in the moment, if I think this image is going to look absolutely stunning and I think you're going to love it, um, there may be a chance that I might ask. Um, and it might be out of your comfort zone. But if at any time you don't want uh, to take it, you just say no, all yeah. good. We'll just move, go right to the next thing, you know. And, and part of that, too, it goes back to it. They've already seen the pose flow. Mm -hmm. They've already seen the mood board and the types of images that we want to uh, create together. So there's not a moment of feeling... Uh, surprised or shocked with mm. something that I may ask or pressured. Yeah, that that's super yeah. important. I have to ask this is kind of just a random question. I'm sticking in here while I'm thinking about it. Sure. You're talking about creating the mood through conversation and yeah. the way that you interact with the client. I, I, I've photographed um, a nude maternity session years ago. Cool. And, and it, I was, it really was such an enjoyable experience. It turned out beautifully right. I, just all the way around. But one of the ways that we helped create a really great atmosphere. When I got yeah. there, actually, it wasn't even me. And when I got there, there was, I think there was already music playing in the background. They just had fun music playing. And that yes. really, it helped alleviate that so-called tension and Absolutely. made a really big difference. Is that something that you do actively? Oh yeah, I mean, I love music. Um, so quick segue, I used to be a teacher, you know, sixth grade math teacher. And so kids didn't like the math. And so, you know, yeah. let's integrate like fun music and make it exciting and engaging. And so I try to take that idea, you know, as they come into the studio space, like have nice music playing, that's calming, you know, and um, there's certain smells, you try to engage every every sense as they come into your space, um, have candles, that's another suggestion, you could use that as well. Um, and again, just work with the lighting, make sure that it's not dark and scary or dark and moody <laughs> before the shoot even begins, you know, sure, if that's sure. the style you're going for. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Cool. Okay. Well, we've alluded to posing a number of times now. You were even talking about a pose flow or flow pose. Let's talk yep. about this third point that you mentioned. And I'm looking at my notebook here because I, I take notes um, sure. as our listeners know, but master your poses was the third point that you made. What is, will you give context to that flow posing that you were talking about? You said the client already knows about that. What does that process look like of, of sharing that with them? Sure. So in the pre-consult phase, um, I like to communicate and shed, sh share, send over a, um, a set of images, concepts, if you will, of mm. uh, the types of images um, that, and poses that the client would get into. Okay. They, and again, they're just, they're more like guidelines, right? Um, <laughs> And it's up to them to see like, okay, cool. So that's the kind of lighting. These are, this is how I'm going to look. And um, the day of, we revisit those, those images together. Those, uh, yeah, essentially the pose flow and mood board. And um, from there, it's just, okay, cool. This is the pose we're going to get into. Let's try this. And then you just make variations of that um, during the session. Um, did that answer your question? I think it did. Well, I, I think it's really cool that you actually share that in advance you know i mean photographers have for years have talked about the idea of flow posing having a, sure. a process by which they approach posing but to actually give the client some type of heads up like the managing their expectations proactively as, as it relates to posing that right. i don't know that i've heard of that before i think that's a really interesting way to approach it thank you i i think um the feedback that i've gotten so far is that uh yeah it really um for a lot of the type a moms and wives that have stepped in it's like I, I have to handle so much and I worry about so many uh, things. So you hand this over to me with like a 20, 30 bullet point checklist with images. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> I can just turn, my, I'll turn my brain off and I know you know what you're doing and it almost gives them like, um, it helps them relax more, you know? Well, but as, as you're talking about that, I'm thinking, I'm sure, yeah, for the type A's, it might give them some right. sense of control uh, sure. and direction. For those that may be more apprehensive, this is another right. way that you're proactively managing their expectations and creating a sense of trust because they may Absolutely. see your pictures, but then they're like, you know, on your Instagram or website or otherwise, but then they're like, what does that actually look like? I don't, I, like, how does he go about creating those? What is that? And so the fact that mm. you let them know that ahead of time probably alleviates a little bit of, of tension and fear. And for everybody listening mm -hmm. in, I, I, this is a massive takeaway, actually. It, it's subtle, but it's, it's actually, a, I think, a really big element of the environment that you're creating for your clients, Jason. I think that's really, yes. really cool. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I hadn't even considered that. Um, it's just something I, I, 
I think for me, if I were on the other end, it's like I want to know what I'm stepping into. So yeah. like, all right, let's let's do it. Let's do it for them. You know. Well, to that end, Alex commented again. She said the communication is a key element. I'm also a photographer, and I over communicate with my clients too. And and this is actually a way that we can communicate with our clients is is even letting mm -hmm. them know what those poses look like. So, sure. I, how many poses are on that or in that uh, kind of pose flow? Oh God. Are there are there like 10, 20, 30, are there a bunch? And do you, do you use every one of them or do you just go to certain ones? Right, it's, uh, so it could be several. Um, the way that I organize it is by location, like the uh, yeah, location in the space, Okay. depending on the lighting. Um, uh -huh. And then from there, like each page would have, let's say nine to 12 images. And it's not the kind of thing where you would use every single one. Um, yeah, so it's really up to you as a photographer now to dictate and direct which ones are going to be used at which point in time, depending on your lighting that you have okay. available. Yeah. So when you say mastering posing, is that what you're talking about contextually posing? Or are you talking about that with a combination or a combination of that and then also just being able to kind of quickly pull them in the moment, knowing which pose to go to? What, what, are, your, right. what are your thoughts on that idea of mastering? For sure. Um, yeah, specifically, how do we define mastering is to not have your, uh, let's say, your pose flow on your phone. That would be like, top tier, next level, like NBA finals, like you've got all 25 poses in your head. And yeah. that's what I'd encourage everybody to have to be able to do is learn and master 25 specific differing poses um, that you can uh, uh, pull out from your mind. Because the last thing you'd want to do, you want to you want to have that direct connection with your client the entire time. And the worst way to do it is to be on your phone. Like, okay, what's, <laughs> what are we doing next? Like, you, you don't want to do that. So right. Um, master 25 specific poses and for me also to have that structure and rhythm in the shoot because within let's say tw your first pose that you, you place your client into um, to have that routine of shooting up high but within that shooting wide a wide focal length a mid focal length and then a close-up then shooting standing wide medium close up and then shooting low to the to the ground to create a, a more um, dominant aspect but again sense. shooting wide medium and close up so Nathan now um, here's my math background. You've got at least nine images there, but multiply that by that 25, mm -hmm. 25 poses that you have. That's at least 225 images, right? So, wow. and you just have to do that back work of like, okay. Um, and even if 25 sounds like a lot, start with five. Start with five, you know? Fair enough. Times yeah. what you said, five, four or five. So now you got 25. I, and I know like mm -hmm. how many pictures would you end up delivering normally, like as a set of proofs to your client after a shoot? Could roughly? be, so... Could be 200, okay. 200, 180 to 200, 150 to 200. That's yeah. a good number from mm -hmm. a portrait session. Okay. Um, moving on then to lighting. We were going to talk about, right. I mean, it, it, this is kind of the, the, the key topic, really. <laughs> Let's talk about sure. lighting, natural light specifically. Again, I, just for point of reference for now, I'll pull up this picture that we were talking about earlier, that the amount of intention behind the way that you lit this particular photograph is just, it's, I mean, it's stunning. It's really, really beautifully done. But I'm curious if there are, or I guess really what are the principles that drive that approach to natural lighting from a technical standpoint that maybe photographers new or, or existing um, could keep in mind while they're shooting? Sure. Um, quick, uh, if I may, um, I've learned a lot actually from a course that I've taken. So could I plug um, someone else in our community? Please, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so Michael Sasser, I've taken uh, two yeah. of his courses already. Like he is the man, like um, I really look up to him and, and I personally love uh, what he's taught me. It's just this basic idea of um, a light triangle. And I've kind of taken a bit of it and made it my own where um, essentially you have three light sources, right? You've got, or you've got three points of your light triangle, your light source, your client, and yourself. And so uh, if you imagine, if you will, a Dorito chip, a tortilla chip, <laughs> okay. uh, with each corner representing one of those aspects, the window, mm -hmm. your client, and yourself in okay. your studio space. And so to increase the contrast and moodiness of your image, you would change your position so that your client is now directly between you and your light source, essentially making a linear direct line. And another uh, illustration would be that's envisioned like a, a solar eclipse. Instead of a triangle now, there would be a line created from the window, the client, and yourself. So you would essentially make a silhouette of your mm. client's figure mm -hmm. in that aspect, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, if you moved slightly to the side, left or right, then the contrast of the light to 
to dark would change. You'd begin to see highlights mixed in with those deep dark shadows because again, um, since light moves in a straight line, the, and if you're controlling the, all the other aspects of the light and the natural light in your space, then the contrast or the light won't wrap around your client's natural curves. And so that would translate in your images with lights and darks across your figure. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So, <laughs> uh, no, it, it very much makes sense that would you say then that you have a 10, I mean, even in fact, let me just pull up your Instagram while we're talking about this. Sure. When you, when, as we're looking at your work here, do you tend to place yourself on one of those corners so that, that the light is, um, I guess, moving kind at of, an angle across your subject most of the time? Do you tend to mix it up? Because I'm seeing, for example, kind of a front facing light here right. uh, with this image. This is backlit kind of silhouette like you were talking about earlier. Sure. This is a really beautiful detail, actually. And Thank it's just you. stunning, subtle use of light. Uh, this is a post for those of you listening to the audio from December 21st on JSE Boudoir uh, on Instagram. But do you have a tendency of one direction or the other? Or do, you, do you try to mix it up as much as possible? Yeah, I definitely try to mix it up for the client, even though my natural lean is uh, the dark and moody. Um, sometimes if, if there's a, a great image like the ones that you've shown where it's like, you know what, let's do, let's do um, an image that's more light and airy uh, with less contrast. And so um, in order to do that, put yourself, you, just, you would just have to put yourself between uh, the window and your client, just like what you, were, what you showed. Right. Now you just have the, um, the window and then now, I actually have a window right here. So the window would be here and then I would be facing this way toward my client. That's essentially what I would be doing. So you just got to manipulate that triangle and that relationship, but that triangle itself would be my starting point. And this is actually a, another beautiful example of what you were just talking about, Jason. Um, December 7th mm -hmm. post on Instagram for anybody who's listening to the audio. You can see this very, very subtle kind of backlight that just skims across the subject's body. And it's just it's beautifully, beautifully done. And I love the subtlety of that. Uh, and, and I also have to give a, a shout out too to uh, to Michael Sasser. You were talking about Michael earlier. Mm -hmm. He's actually been on the podcast a couple of times back <laughs> episode 502 and then all the way back in episode 46, actually. So for those of you listening in, make sure you go back and check out uh, those episodes. Jason, I, I know that yeah. th when it comes to natural lighting, I mean, it's such a, a loaded topic. But sure. if, if we were to kind of leave our listeners with, you've, you've really kind of given a nice, well-rounded, kind of all-inclusive picture of the way that you approach the session. But specifically when it comes to natural light, are there two or three big ideas that, that come to mind uh, just off the top that you would say to a photographer who's like, you know what, I'm, I'm just about to, to dive into this genre and I love the sure. idea of photographing with natural light. I really love your work, Jason. Are there two or three big ideas that I should keep in mind that will, that will really help me see success in this particular niche of the genre uh, as I go forward? So specifically, how, how, how can I succeed um, in natural light boudoir photography, like a couple ideas. Yeah, I, I know oh, that man. we've talked about mm -hmm. some lighting principles on a, a little bit more yeah. technical level, but if yeah. there was just a, like even just one or two really key takeaways that, that in addition to these principles that a photographer should right. keep in mind here as we're closing the conversation, what would those be? Oh, man, that's a good, good I put thought. you on the Let spot. Just... No, it's not. That's good. I mean, the big thing is always to, I think, push yourself. Um, kind of like going back to your question about what's my favorite piece of gear? between the 24 to 70 or my 50, I, it was very hard for me to choose because um, I don't want to get complacent. And I think that would be my encouragement to the listeners out there is don't get complacent with, you know, I have this one lens and I, 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 that's all I'm going to use, you know, mm -hmm. um, or I have this one pose and that's all I'm going to use. Like you have to continually try new things. You hear it all the time. And, um, and if you don't take those shots, you're not, you're not going to grow, you know, um, I think that would be the biggest thing, whether if it's, and it can relate to your gear or it can relate to the way that you're posing um, or even like we're talking about in the lighting, you know, just continually challenge yourself and analyze and self-assess what, what areas you, you're excelling at and then self-assess and gain, gain feedback from uh, trusted mentors and, and colleagues of areas that you can improve. Fair enough. Well, I, here as we close, I'm, I've just pulled up your website again, jseboudoir.com. And then, of course, the same thing on Instagram. And uh, we'll make sure to link to that in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Jason, I, I really, really appreciate you making time to come and share. Um, sure, it was a lot and, of fun. And we, what's that? 
it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh no, you're you're obvious. You mentioned being a teacher. You're obviously a teacher. You communicate very very clearly, and and I love that. Um, I I think that for our listeners, there's a lot of practical information here to consider. And for those of you that have aren't following Jason already, make sure that you do. And of course, we'll link to all the resources in the show notes at bocapodcast.com. Thanks again, Jason. I really appreciate you yeah. sharing with us. Thanks for having me on the show. Much appreciated.